I'm going to be talking um, primarily from a developmental perspective, so how children acquire uh, scientific and religious concepts. And as my comment um, um, earlier uh, underlined then, I see myself as focusing in on one of the particular questions that we might ask about the relationship between science and religion. We could look at the history of the institutional relationship, the synergies, the conflicts that there have been. We could look at people's views, lay people's views, but we can also ask about how uh, thinking about scientific concepts and religious concepts gets going in young children, and that's my theme. And what I'm going to argue um, is that um, I don't see much evidence for any um, particular dedicated system for acquiring religious beliefs. If anything, I see a more generic cognitive system that's equally adroit at uh, picking up uh, religious beliefs and more secular beliefs. So that'll be my general conclusion and argument. Just to give you a quick overview, let me give you some theoretical background. First of all, I've worked on children's learning from testimony, what other people tell them, and I've looked at uh, children's imagination, and I want to say a little bit about both of those and how they connect, and eventually underpin children's uh, belief in invisible entities, germs, um, <clears throat> angels, and so forth. And I'll, then I'll turn finally to children's belief in beings with special powers. So let's start with the theoretical background. So if you look at toddlers, I think they display two really important capacities, a capacity for pretend play and a capacity for learning from what other people tell them, uh, including what other people tell them about invisible entities. So let me just flesh out those two claims with a little bit of experimental detail. So some years ago, uh, together with Bob Cavanaugh, I did a study, this would be with two-year-olds, in which the two-year-old watches us, their play partner, and as their play partner, we might pick up uh, a milk carton, which has got no milk in, it's empty, and we, as it were, pour pretend milk into a container and put the carton down. And then we carry this container over to a toy horse who's on the table, turn the container upside down, and then ask the child what's happened. We might contrast um, that little two-part episode with a slightly different one in which uh, we pick up a talcum powder can, shake that into the container, and then walk over with the container to the toy horse and turn that upside down. Now, if you ask children at this point what's happened to the horse, what's intriguing is that they give you different answers depending upon what they've seen. And notice that that second part, the empty hand or the empty container being moved and inverted, is exactly the same. But nevertheless, children use their imagination to work out what the different consequences would be depending upon whether it was, as it were, pretend milk or pretend powder in the container. And depending on what they've seen then, they say that the horse has now ended up wet or milky or he's got powder on him, or all uh, powdery. More generally, children take their naive physics about the transportation of objects, of gravity, etc., and they plug it into this imaginative system, and it disciplines the system to yield um, plausible results, which they can then verbalize to you. So there's an index of the richness of the child's imagination, but richness disciplined, as I say, by causal knowledge. The other thing I want to emphasize is, again, an early, an early emerging capacity in, <clears throat> among two-year-olds to learn about testimony with respect to invisible objects. So in these studies, we give the child a toy and they hide it at one of several places in the room. Let's call it location A. They then go out of the room with the experimenter to a side room. And at this point, one of two things can happen. They're held up so that they can look back into the original room through a window and they see another experimenter move the toy from where they put it, place A, to a new place, place B. Or they're not lifted up, uh, they can't see back into the room. 
Instead, the second experimenter eventually comes to tell them what she's done. She says, I move the toy from A to B. She doesn't, of course, talk about A and B, but you know what I mean. What happens? If you let the 30-month-old now go back into the room, whether they were told or whether they watched, the 30-month-olds go to B. The younger toddlers, not quite so good, if they watch what happened, they go to B. But if they were told what happened, they're likely to make a mistake. As you can see in these results here, the, uh, the, the, the younger infants, not yet, <clears throat> not just before their second birthday, making lots of mistakes on the testimony condition. But what I really want to emphasize are the 30-month-olds. What are they doing? Well, they're doing equally well in both conditions, but more generally, um, if we think about those 30-month-olds, they're essentially accepting other people's testimony about a world that they cannot see for themselves. And they treat that as veridical, as more reliable than the world that they themselves observed before they left the room. So even these two and a half year olds are already willing to place a good deal of credence in testimony and to treat test testimony, other people's testimony, as in some sense a more reliable indication of the way the world is than what they have seen for themselves. So I think those two capacities then, the capacity to think about the invisible as we see in the child's imagination and the capacity to learn from testimony is sufficient now for the child to start building a belief in the reality of unseen entities. And some of these may be entities that are continuously invisible, such as oxygen. Um, so going beyond what we've just seen with a toy that's temporarily invisible, we can see that the child might begin to be credulous or accepting of the existence of entities that they can never see. So some time ago we did a study, um, it was mentioned earlier, um, in which young children were quizzed about um, scientific invisibles at the bottom there, germs and oxygen, or real entities, rabbits and giraffes, or impossible entities. We were pretty confident that children would deny the existence of the impossible entities, except the existence of the real entities, our real question is, what would they believe about the existence of things they had never seen? And it, in all of these cases, children were simply asked, are there really? And here are the results. As you can see that, not very surprisingly, both age groups deny the existence of the impossible, accept the existence of the real entities, the giraffes and rabbits. But what is especially striking is that their confidence in these invisibles, they've never seen them, is just as strong as it is in the real entities. We then moved on to ask children not just about scientific invisibles, but about what we called endorsed beings. That's to say, uh, beings that the surrounding community will likely um, endorse, at least for children of a given age. We also asked whether children believe in anything they hear about. Uh, do they believe even in mermaids and ghosts? After all, they hear about mermaids and ghosts, but the community doesn't really argue that they exist or imply any causal relationship to the child's actual world. So again, children are asked, are there really? And here are the findings. Germs and oxygen, lots of confidence in those, replicating what you saw a moment ago. Um, lots of confidence in the tooth fairy, God, Santa Claus, and so forth. Although a subtle difference, as you can see also, they're a bit more confident about the scientific entities. That's a whole other story in itself, which I won't go into today. But last but not least, mermaids and ghosts so are, are not really eliciting much confidence. So children are listening to the pattern of discourse. It's not as if they believe in anything they hear about. They're connecting it, they're, they're listening attentively to whether this is um, something that's asserted to be in existence or merely to be, to be fantastical or talked about in the context of stories. What is interesting um, about um, both of the, the, the two domains of germs and oxygen, and tooth fairy and God, is that <clears throat> when you ask children then, having said that they exist to justify their belief, the pattern of their justification turns out to be very similar. 
So we found that children sometimes mentioned an encounter, sometimes focused on the source, sometimes offered a generalization when they talked about the various characteristics, and we plotted the frequency with which they offered those three types of explanation for the different types of entity. And the basic findings are here. As you can see, for the scientific entities, germs and oxygen, they typically offer you a generalization, often a generalization emphasizing the causal <coughs> properties. But interestingly, that same pattern is found for the tooth fairy god and Santa Claus. So here is encouraging evidence that the children, at this age at least, at five and six years of age, are not thinking of these categories as ontologically distinct, at least if you probe the, the form of the justification that they offer. Conversely, as you can see, mermaids and ghosts, um, a, very, a very different pattern of explanation. I think Andrew may be elaborating on these data with respect to adults. We can ask whether this, this pattern of similarity between the scientific and the endorsed entities is preserved um, among older children and among adults. Okay, quick summary of where we are so far then. So children accept the existence of real but temporarily invisible entities, continuously invisible entities, endorsed entities, and children justify their belief in the scientific and the endorsed uh, in roughly the same way if we look at their justifications. So my conclusion at this point is that no obvious conflict between the scientific domain and the religious domain. Okay. Which is what I've said here. Could I just get a sense of how much time I've got left? Three minutes. Good Lord. <laughs> okay, let, right. So let me now turn to beings with special powers. So some people have, have argued that children have a natural disposition to believe in the existence of beings with special powers. I don't think they have a natural disposition. They have a generic disposition, which might or might not lead them, depending upon the surrounding testimony that they have. I'm going to go very quickly through this study in which children were first of all checked for their ability to use a story to decide what the main protagonist was like in terms of his or her status. So here's a story in which the soldier is um, attributed some special characteristic, his special sword which kept him dying in any battle and the expectation would be that the children might judge that soldier then to be pretend rather than real. Conversely, this is a very fierce soldier named Bill Gold, fought in many wars, died in Virginia. Nothing <coughs> impossible or, or fantastical, we would expect children to assign that soldier to the real box. Here's what, in fact, the children did. Let me focus on the older group, the five and six-year-olds. They systematically judge children, judge stories where the character is described as being involved in historical events, prosaic events, as real, and they assign the character with some kind of fantastical element um, to the pretend box. I'm going to skip that and move on to religious stories, since that's what I really want to emphasize. So prior, so at the end, at the end of that study that we have, I've just mentioned, we emphasize that children have a pretty good ability to distinguish between what we call fairy stories, in which there's some magical or impossible element, and historical narratives in which nothing untoward or implausible is described. And our basic argument was that by five or six years of age, children have a kind of magic detector which allows them to identify a story as including a, an impossible element, in which case they judge it to be fiction. But that, creates, that account creates uh, an interesting dilemma then with respect to religious stories. Lots of religious stories include impossible elements, and yet they're not presented to children as fictional, they're presented to children as factual. So we wondered about how children would react to those stories, and in particular about the extent to which children would regard the protagonist in that story as pretend or real. We tested four different groups of children in Boston, and we were 
expecting that religious background might have an impact on the children. And we measured their religiosity in two different ways, whether they went to church or uh, whether they were attending a parochial school. And you can see we've got every combination of those. In particular, focus on the children at the bottom who don't go to church and are attending a state school, a non-parochial school, because they'll turn out to be different from the three other groups. So we gave all four groups three different types of story, realistic, with no impossible events, the kind of fairy stories that I've described up until now, but also religious stories with miraculous events. Here's a quick uh, overview of a particular story that went through the various changes. The top one, nothing impossible happening. The, fair, the middle one, Joseph has magical powers. The religious one, Joseph is given some power um, through God's intervention. Here's the frequency with which children from the three religious groups um, judged the main character to be a real person. As you can see, they're happy to do that for the realistic stories. They're much less inclined to do it when magic is involved. But interestingly, these these three religious groups think of the mir miraculous stories, the stories with some kind of divine agency, as being about a real person. There's very little difference in their judgment between um, the religious story, which they accept to be factual, and the realistic story, which they also accept to be factual. So now let's take a look at the fourth group, the children who had had uh, no opportunity to go to church and were attending state schools, here are the findings. So you can see they agree with the other three groups about the realistic stories. A huge thumping difference, though, when it comes to the religious stories. I mean, essentially what these children, to simplify, are uh, doing is responding to these religious stories as if they were fairy stories. What does that imply? Well, I think it implies that children um, in the absence of religious instruction, um, argue that the protagonist is not real because he's alleged to do something that's impossible. But more generally, I want to argue that contrary to the investigators I mentioned a moment ago, Jess, Jesse Baring, Justin Barrett, there's no obvious tendency, some, no irresistible tendency that children have to think of there being special agents with special powers. Depending upon the child's education, they can devolve into little atheists, so to speak, who deny the existence of such people or accept them insofar as they're fictional characters in fairy stories, but nothing more. So conclusions then, children can represent the invisible and learn about it via testimony. That's how they learn about germs and angels. Um, and that's how they may or may not, if they're growing up in a secular environment, come to believe in agents with the power to perform miracles. As I've emphasized, children have no natural disposition to believe in beings with special powers. So to that extent, I'm disagreeing with all of those people who think there's some natural proclivity to uh, engage in religious thinking. I think there's something more generic which allows you to engage in both religious thinking and scientific thinking. Thank you.